Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome James Tobin back to our At Home with Literati virtual event series in support of Sing to the Colors in conversation this evening with John Lofi. Just a quick webinar overview for our attendees. The chat is closed, but you can keep the chat window open as I will be sharing links to purchase Sing to the Colors from Literati throughout the event. Live transcription is available to you on your toolbar as well, should you need it when you're watching us live. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, you can always find links to purchase books in the description direct, directly below me. And you can also be sure to like and subscribe to our videos to be kept up to date with all of our events once they become available on our YouTube channel. And as a reminder, you can also shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan, of course, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. Most of all, though, we'd just like to thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning uh, or this afternoon uh, or much later this evening, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us. So without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. James Tobin teaches literary journalism and narrative history in the Department of Media, Journalism, and Film at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. He has PhD in history at the University of Michigan and worked for 12 years as a reporter for the Detroit News. He is the author of several books, uh, including Ernie Pyle's War, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award. And he'll be speaking tonight with John Lofi. John is the Executive Director of Marketing and Communications in the College of Literature, Science, and Arts at the University of Michigan. A native of Minnesota, John earned his bachelor's degree at the University of Wisconsin and his MFA in creative writing at Michigan. In a past incarnation, he was editor of Michigan Today, the UM magazine that reaches hundreds of thousands of alumni readers every month. And in that role, he edited many of Jim Tobin's writings about U of M history. So please join me in welcoming uh, James Tobin and John Lofi into your living rooms. Uh, hi, uh, thank you, John, for the introduction. And uh, Jim, thanks for asking me to be part of uh, tonight's um, events. Um, uh, just a quick word before um, I make an introduction about the book that we're going to hear from tonight. Um, most of you who are attending probably already know that Jim is um, not only an extraordinary writer, but also uh, a legend among writers here in Ann Arbor, um, a, a community of writers. He's a writer's writer. He's a journalist journalist and a historian's historian. He is um, someone that I as an editor and I know my, my colleague editors around the university and at other publications in the area turn to for trustworthy, reliable, insightful, fun, and always, always illuminating essays and explorations of the world that we live in and how it got this way and who helped shape it. And um, I'll speak as a, a, a friend and an editor of Jim's who worked with him for a long time on some of the pieces that we'll talk about tonight. And um, uh, I, I think if you don't know, you'll know by the end of tonight that he's a man of extraordinary integrity and, um, and, and really, really uh, will be someone that you enjoy hearing from. It's always a pleasure for me to be able to talk to him. And it's great that we have this opportunity together. Jim, um, I know you don't like me to ever say like flattering things about you, but um, it's all I think about when I think about you. And I know that many, many people um, think about you in that way as our, our trustworthy historian um, and, and friend of the University of Michigan. And so tonight we're here to um, celebrate the release of Jim's new book and hear uh, from him, uh, read, read from uh, that and for us to talk a little bit about it. The book is Sing to the Colors, a writer explores two centuries at the University of Michigan. This is a collection of essays that Jim's been working on for something like 15 years exploring um, the history of the university, both of big events and, uh, and, and small crannies and, and interesting tidbits of the history. And so um, we'll, uh, I'm delighted to be able to join you today, Jim, and, and uh, hear some of 
what you have to share with us. And so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Well, thanks an awful lot, John. Gosh, what nice things you said. And I can tell everybody listening, uh, I could say many more nice things about my dear friend, John Lofi. And uh, by the way, a great writer and a great editor in his own right, the university is very lucky to have him. Um, so I wanted to start with um, a little reading from uh, some early pages in the book. This is the little introductory essay that I wrote to the first section of the book, which deals with the campus itself. Um, the, it's called part one, the place itself. There are numerous chapters in that, in that section. And this is what I wrote to begin that. On any street corner around the campus, I can look here or there and suddenly feel as if I'm looking down through layers of time, my own time, my family's time, the university's time. Say I'm at the corner of Hill and Washtenaw, standing by the rock. Across Washtenaw, behind some trees, there's a stone house with a tower. Henry Simmons Fries used to live there. He was the popular professor of Latin who stepped in as president of the university when James Burl Angel was on leave as US minister to China in the 1880s. Fries did more than anyone else to make music a central part of life at Michigan. I see the house and then I see Professor Fries. If I pivot to look across Hill Street, I see the rambling house where John Sinclair's rainbow people lived when Sinclair went to prison for possession of two joints and Free John became a pro-marijuana rallying cry. <clears throat> that was in 1969. I see the house and then I see that crazy bunch of hippies. Up the long slant of Washtenaw Avenue is the Fidela Theta house, where my dad was set up on a blind date with my mom, who lived a few blocks away at Kappa Kappa Gamma. That was in 1938. Kitty Corner from the Kappa house in 2013. I dropped off my younger daughter to start her freshman year at East Quad, where I had started my own first year in 1974. I see us all. Or say I'm at the corner of State and South University. I turn and see John F. Kennedy on the steps of the Union, asking a crowd of students, how many of you are going to be doctors? Who are going to be doctors? Are willing to spend your days in Ghana? Technicians or engineers, how many of you are willing to work in the Foreign Service and spend your lives traveling around the world? That was very late one night in the fall of 1960. Then I turn and look at the law school and see the, sculpt the sculptors who carved the comic stone heads for the main archway of the Lawyers Club. That was in 1924. One of those heads is a likeness of Henry Philip Tappan, who lived across the street in the president's house, the only building still standing from the original campus. He stayed from 1852 until the regents fired him in 1863, though he was the one who envisioned the university we know today. I see him too. The University of Michigan has never been renowned for its architecture. It grew as a hodgepodge to serve utilitarian needs. Despite touches of beauty in this building or that, even a charitable outsider would say that any overall theme is at best vigorous eclect eclecticism. But I am not a visitor. I feel attached to the place, the physical concrete place, not because of its architectural graces. What I feel as I walk around campus is akin to what I feel when I go back and look at the house and the yard where I grew up. When I see late afternoon light on the dark brick of the Michigan League or the girth of the Tappan Oak by the north wing of the Harlan Hatcher Graduate Library, a sense stirs that I belong to this ground and the ground belongs to me. The past can be understood as our companion. It lends us a system of echolocation, a way of knowing where we are in time and thus of knowing who we are. That's a comfort in any era and certainly in this one with so much in flux. The physical place of the campus is an irreplaceable embodiment of a student's connection to the long phenomenon of the university as an idea and a mission. I don't believe there really can be a college without a campus. Okay, John. Thank you. That was lovely. And um, 
you know, one of the things that puts me in mind too, and I, I'm, I'm, I know that there are a lot of Michigan alums and students who have this same experience. Um, I'm, I'm a multi-generational Michigan family too. My, uh, my wife's parents met here. <clears throat> my wife and I came here for grad school 30 years ago and thought we'd be here for two years and here we still are. And my oldest son has graduated from here and my younger son is a senior. And these connections are really, um, really deep and really profound. And my affection for the place is like yours. It, it very much feels like home now. Um, and, and, you know, I've been thinking a lot about, as we talked a little bit about like this piece and how you wanna start today, thinking about these generations of people who come through here, whether it's literal family generations or just the number of iterations and new people that have come through here and the different kinds of experiences they've had, whether that was you know, in the 60s or during World War II or during the uh, World War I era or now through the pandemic. Um, and one of the things that you and I have talked about a lot and that you introduced to me as an idea is the importance of institutions. And you said to me once early on as we were collaborating how much institutions meant to you because of their continuity. And, and at least what I think of is the way that they bind us and make possible things across these vast time spans that we couldn't accomplish ourselves, right? They tie us together in these ways. And um, you wrap up the book, you know, the, the book is bookended with this, with these thoughts about the institution as a whole. And I'm really curious because so much of your work is this sort of interplay between individuals and the work that they do and the larger institution, which is really the product of us. And I, I wonder, like, could you just share some of your thoughts about you know, the importance of institutions and maybe this one in particular and how that, you know, how that influences your thinking about the university's history? Hmm. Well, um, uh, you know, you and I both have talked about this conversation that we had back uh, some years ago about this. And I, I think we both sort of stumbled on this idea that, that, that we shared. Um, I guess part of my thought is a certain defensiveness about the University of Michigan. You know, institutions in general in our society have, you know, haven't looked very great in the last 50 years. Um, and, um, and, and for good reason. Um, but I guess when I have thought hard about um, the university's role in, in my family's life and the impact that it has far beyond, you know, just my little circle. Um, I'm just moved as, as I think you are by, by the power of this, of this thing that, that has been, that, that, that you know, began um, in Ann Arbor 150 years ago in Detroit even longer ago than that. It's this, it's this growing, changing thing that is, that is nothing more than people cooperating with each other in the service of truth, in the service of learning. Um, and that just seems to me like the highest mission that, that an institution could have. There are many other institutions you and I both could name that don't show up so well. Uh, and God knows the university has, uh, has, has always had its faults. It has stumbled, it has done bad things to people from time to time. Um, but it, it struggles toward this ideal. And, uh, I, you know, as I get older and, and I think about the fragility of important institutions, you know, right up to the, to, to the, to, to the country itself, which has been so shaken by events recently, um, that's when I feel that, that sense of wanting to protect and cherish um, this institution that I care a great deal about. Um, I've come to same, feel the same way about the, the college where I teach, Miami University in Ohio. Um, and, you know, these, these places just matter. So I, I, don't know, I don't know how else to say it than that. Um, but it has, it has led me to be, therefore, curious about the place. Uh, you know, how did, how, did, how did this place get to be what it is um, for, for good and for ill? I'm fascinated by you know these these little stories that that I that I see around me physically. I'm and then I'm 
fascinated by the, the stories that that I stumble across or that someone mentions to me that the, the, the records of which are out at the great Bentley Historical Library on North Campus where most of the work for this book was, was done. So strangely, you know, you know, and you and I started this as this little freelance gig that I wanted to do, right? To make money. I was, I was a freelance writer and um, I had done one piece for you about Avery Hopwood when you were editor of Michigan Today. You were just starting out, I think. And um, we thought, hey, you know, there could be a history thing every month. Um, and that just kind of grew and grew. And I, I haven't lost my appetite to, to, to write about all this. Well, that's great. Thank you. Um, so the book, I don't know if folks can see it. I've got a little blurred background, but the book uh, here um, it, it consists of a whole bunch of essays that you've written. Uh, certainly not everything that you've written on university history, but, but a, a nice collection, largely chronologically arranged. Um, and so as you talk about, you know, how, how did we get here? The first question that comes to me is like thinking about the, the many, many stories that you've accumulated here. Um, what were some of the seminal moments in your mind, particularly ones that maybe you, that we might not know about? I mean, we know, we know many of them, but. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, when, when you and I started this project uh, first, you know, in Michigan today, and then that led to, um, to me writing for this website uh, that was really conceived by our friend and colleague, Kim Clark called the Heritage Project, where the stories are longer and, and you know, more illustrated. They, they're, they're sort of more uh, body and substance to them. Uh, from, uh, all of us who have worked on this have thought, let's, let's find the stories that people don't know. So, I mean, I, I referred to the famous story of John F. Kennedy and the steps of the Union proposing what would become the Peace Corps. You know, that's one of the sort of standard stories about U of M that everybody knows about. Um, another one is the, 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 the running of the tests that, that uh, showed that the Salk polio vaccine in the early 50s was safe. That was a huge announcement that was made uh, in the Rackham building. That's sort of standard U of M history. But there's so much that, that most folks don't know about. Um, so, I mean, I could start with a name that's certainly familiar to everybody. Henry Philip Tappan, the first um, real president of the university people don't know that he fell out of favor with the regents in the middle of the civil war and was essentially booted out by the regents, this, this huge figure who had founded the, 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 the university that we know it had started many years earlier in Detroit as just a little school basically. And that Tappan had the vision that, um, that this was going to be a great research university on the uh, sort of on the model of the great uh, German Prussian uh, research universities in Europe. And there were only a couple of places remotely like this in, in the United States. Tappan envisioned it in this little frontier town in Michigan. Uh, and, and not only that, but it would be a, a public institution of that sort. Now this was really, a, a, you know, a revolutionary idea. Um, but, <laughs> As you might imagine, for somebody who had such grand ambitions, uh, Tappan was uh, something of an arrogant man. Um, I say uh, in the essay about how he came to his end at Michigan that uh, he was a guy who thought God was on his side in every argument that he had, you know, down to uh, the smallest details of running the university. And that rubbed uh, people the wrong way, especially uh, uh, people in the, among the regions. And, um, other sort of associates of the university who, who didn't have the kind of education that Tappan had. Um, and so he was seen as this kind of uh, pompous Eastern aristocrat. He was married to a literal, uh, to, to a literal American aristocrat, a member of the Livingstone family of, of uh, upstate New York. And uh, she, Mrs. Mrs. Tappan came to Michigan with the, those same sorts of airs. And so they ran a follow of people, especially the editor of the Detroit Free Press who, who took after um, Tappan as a, this, this terrible um, elitist aristocrat. So um, that, that conflict uh, between the sort of um, the, the, this, this elite figure at the university 
And then the, the, the people of the state who were called upon to pay their taxes and to support the university in various ways, that conflict, which we still feel today, um, began all the way back in Tappan's time. And I mean, that just leaped out at me when I started to read about Tappan's fate at the university. So that was one thing. Another, another thing that I, I think a lot, of, a lot more people know about now, um, it's been talked about more in recent years, going back to the same period, was the uh, sort of the creation of the Diag as we know it. It's this place um, that is, is this lovely forested area, uh, you know, sort of semi-forested, these beautiful trees that, that, that we all love throughout the Diag. And that came about um, because a professor, a, a very young guy named Andrew Dixon White, was hired by Tappan actually in the 1850s, came to Michigan. The campus was still this raw sort of farmscape and um, White had gone to Yale where the elms were beautiful and of course a much older place. He said, why aren't there any trees here? And so he took it upon himself to plant these elms up and down the, the, the sort of rough walkways of the Diag. And that essentially led to the way the Diag is laid out today, but where the walkways are, where the sidewalks are, the basic X pattern. And it made the Diag a, a place of beauty and it was all because of the sort of the initiative of this one young professor who went off and, and became the founding president of Cornell. So, I mean, those are a couple of moments that, that um, it, it jump out at me as things that, that people don't know much about. Um, when you and I were talking yesterday about the book, um, I, I mentioned a, a story that, that I loved to do the research for, which was about the, um, the time in the, in the 60s, in 1967, when students suddenly, um, uh, you know, in the rebellious mood of the 60s, decided that the um, very strict rules about uh, the hours that they could keep, especially women, uh, that they were just weren't going to put up with those anymore. Now, this was a system called hours. What were the what were the what were the restricted hours in which you could have visitors in the dorm uh, of either sex? And in a very short period, um, students protested, uh, started to engage in acts of civil disobedience, basically, um, and very quickly, within a space of weeks, actually, uh, insisted on opening up the rules in the dorms. And um, the administration decided to experiment with those new rules. The regents ultimately approved it. And so the whole regime of campus living that students have today uh, came about sort of in the blink of an eye uh, because of fellow students back in that uh, era. Um, and so my story called The End of Hours, um, I, I think catches this moment that, that um, where, where all of a sudden things changed and the lives of students were, were different from then on. So, um, you know, going way back and then in the more recent past that, you know, many graduates, many alums remember, those, those are a couple of those kinds of things that, that I just loved working on. You bring up the, the movement of the students to get rid of hours. And, you know, one of the things that Michigan is known for and has been for as long as I know, I, I've known of Michigan is, you know, student activism and student engagement and student involvement. And, you know, while official histories typically, you know, talk about the, the great man or the, you know, the influence of a president or, you know, a dean or something like that, um, clearly students have had a profound impact on shaping the institution and on, on driving change here. Um, you know, you've got, you've got a piece about uh, BAM, the Black Action Movement. Um, talked about some of the things that happened around Michigama um, in the early 2000s. You know, what's your take on the role of students in shaping the institution? And, you know, how, what's the nature of that? Is, is it possible even to say there's a nature of that influence? Hmm. Or is it too eclectic itself? Um, um, yeah, so, I mean, students have had impacts in uh, various kinds over, over all these years. Um, certainly in the 60s and perhaps even starting in the 50s, 
when the university got so much bigger in the years after World War II, um, students were, you know, I mean, people 19, 20, 21 years old are, are, are in a very distinctive phase of life where they are moving into adulthood and feeling their independence, groping for their independence and sort of enacting the drama of becoming adults, you know, all in this one place together. Um, and, and that has always been a difficult sort of human force for first faculty and then increasingly administrators to manage. And, you know, James Angel said in, in a lecture that he remarks that he made to students one time, uh, uh, Angel was an expert on international law, continued to teach a course in that while he was president. And he was talking about the um, sort of the nature of precedent, legal precedents. And uh, he said, he said, you know, we, when we decide where to put a sidewalk on the campus, we look at where you fellows, and it was almost all fellows at that time, um, we look at where you fellows have trod a path across the grass, and that's where we put our sidewalks. He says, that's the best example of precedent that I can give. Somehow that example still resonates, I think. Um, students do what they want to do. They find ways to get away with stuff. And uh, that, that, that's ha that happens outside the classroom. And I think to some extent it happens inside the classroom. And so faculty administrators must respond to this sort of massive oceanic force that they're trying to manage. Um, so, you know, the, the end of hours is, is one example. Um, uh, you know, uh, you can think of others. I mean, for instance, uh, this isn't in the, this piece isn't in the book, but I've always been as a as a as a faculty member, professor myself. I've always been troubled by the role of grades, the the enormous role that grades play uh, in students' lives. It always troubles me when I'm walking around down at Miami and I think to myself, well, when I've overheard students today talk about their courses, what did I hear them talk about? All they talked about was the points that the professor gave them on a particular exam, the grade that they were worried about getting for the course. They don't talk enough about the content of the courses. Well, I got interested in that. What happened at Michigan? When did the grading system start becoming at Michigan? It happened under Angel. Um, there was an interesting tradition um, at Michigan of uh, um, the, the uh, basically a pass fail system, okay? And um, it was understood that, that you know, you would, if, if you were diligent in your coursework, you would pass the course. Um, and if you were not diligent, you would not pass the course. That, that, that strikes me as the best way to go. Um, now, the, 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 the problem is, the, the thing that I was interested to learn was that it was actually students themselves who began to demand a grading system. Uh, this happened, um, I think, um, uh, more in the East first and then it spread West. Students at Michigan around the time of the turn of the century realized that uh, students in the, in the Ivy League were getting grades. And this was a way of distinguishing yourself from your peers. So at the same time, you know, the competition is becoming fiercer for uh, careers, jobs in the corporate world, in the professions. And so uh, students wanted to, to, you know, make themselves distinctive. And so they began to ask for the grading system. So the, 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 the system that we've been burdened by ever since uh, was brought about by students themselves. You wouldn't have thought so, um, but the faculty, the faculty picked up on student demands there. So there's another example of students sort of, uh, of, of making, you know, pushing for, insisting on making change themselves. I, I remember reading that uh, in, in the first time in your draft and was flabbergasted. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, the, let me ask, were there, I'm, I'm gonna shift this up. Um, were there one or two essays? I mean, it's not fair to ask you for a favorite in here, but I'm, I'm gonna do it anyway. You know, were there yeah. one or two essays in here that you just took particular pleasure in researching or writing or just delight in the story itself? 
Yeah, I mean, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, now, in, in some ways, I, I'm looking through the table of contents now, and I'm realizing that I kind of picked all my favorites. <laughs> and and the, the ones that I didn't pick, and there are lots that I, are not in the book that I've written, you know, like, I'm not going to put that one in here, you know, because I, I don't think it's good enough, or I, some, for whatever reason, I, I didn't enjoy it as much. Let me mention a, a, a few. Um, so one of the stories that I, I did early, um, and I, I think you'll remember this one, um, I, I developed a story about the first um, women to attend the university in the early 1870s. Um, and while I was doing that, I kind of stumbled on this young woman named um, Mary Downing Sheldon. She was from upstate New York and she was in not the very first class, but I think the second class of women, I think she entered in 1872. And um, I was doing for, uh, research for a, a book on Franklin Roosevelt and um, Smith College was nearby where um, her papers were. She had become a pretty distinguished educator herself. And there's this wonderful collection of her materials, almost all of which were uh, her letters back home to Oswego to New York, to her parents and her best friend from Ann Arbor in the 1870s. And it was just this amazing cache of personal letters where she just laid out what it was like, not just to be a, a woman, to be, but to be a student at Michigan in that era. So I wrote a long ass story about Mary Sheldon and I just loved working on that. I've said, said it to my wife, uh, first of all, I kind of developed a crush on Mary Sheldon. Um, was fascinated by her life. And so that's one of them that I think is nice. And really, just because her, her own writings were so great, her own letters really give us a picture of life as a student in that very long ago time. Um, another favorite of mine, um, <laughs> I think you'll remember this. I don't think you know which one I'm going to say. It's, it's the only piece that we couldn't get past your boss at Michigan today, uh, Nancy Connell, right? Who's, who's, who was a fine person and she was a good person to work for, but she didn't want to run this story. Uh, we called it the mystery of Belford Lawson. It ran, first of all, in the Ann Arbor Observer. Um, it's a story that was suggested to me by um, two people, I can't remember which came first. Um, a guy named Greg Kinney, who was a wonderful archivist at the Bentley Library and an expert on the athletic history of Michigan. And then also an old friend of mine from the Michigan Daily, Rich Lerner, who had who tracked sort of the, the history of Michigan football. They both knew about this guy named Belford Lawson, who, um, this, was this, this is the question, was he on the varsity football team or not? Um, he was if, if so, he was the only black player to actually be on the varsity in the time of Fielding Yost, legendarily racist son of a Confederate, um, who was the big man in Michigan football for many, many years, but did not want blacks to play on his football team. And so looking into that story, I was able to get in touch with his son, um, a wonderful man, Belford Lawson, the fourth, I think he is, third or fourth who wanted to an answer to this question, had his father actually made the team? And so trying to understand that with the fragmentary documents that we had um, just captivated me. And um, uh, the, the communications folks felt that wasn't the right story <laughs> to highlight. I think you wanted to run it. And um, I think other editors would have run it. Nancy had cold feet about it. I hope she isn't listening. So we're embarrassing her. Um, you know, we, you and I and Ken Clark and Deborah Holdship, who succeeded you as the editor of Michigan Today, we all felt that even though the university was paying me to write these stories, <clears throat> that it was right to, to, to be frank. And um, if the story led in directions that made the university look bad, so be it. Um, we wanted to be true to the, to the university's mission, to pursue the truth and tell the truth. And so that was a story that where the university didn't look so good. Um, but I think we all have thought that if we were frank with um, the readers of these pieces, we would, you know, draw their loyalty. 
uh, we would we would justify their their readership, and so we told those stories. So that's another favorite of mine. Uh, let me look. Um, well, it was fun to tell the story about J Hop, uh, the long running great you know dance, the social event of the year for decades um, that I had grown up hearing my mom and dad talk about. Um, I started out thinking it was going to be a story just about the amazing swing bands that came to Ann Arbor to play for j Hop year after year. And I mean the best bands in America, Tommy Dorsey, Benny Goodman, um, uh, Duke Ellington. I mean, you know, just these superstars of the jazz era. But I realized when I started to do that research that yeah, the music was really important, but I got interested in j Hop as this sort of speaking of institutions, this, this student created student run um, great event that happened every year. And sort of, it sort of was a way of telling about the rise and fall of sort of this really uh, involved um, dance centric social life that, uh, that, that existed uh, among students at Michigan for decades. And then it came to an end right at the end of the 50s. And that too was sort of symbolic of, of this, of the great, of the great shift that happened in, in student social life with the coming of the 60s. People started not to want to go to a, a, a big thing like j -Hop. didn't want to get dressed up um, in that way. You know, it was it was definitely the passing of an era. I can only I was only a kid when this happened. I can only imagine what my parents thought about the end of j -Hop. You know, I say in the story, it was like the Beatles were coming to, to campus um, and uh, they got to, you know, buy tickets and go dance to those people. So that was that was a fun one to, to think about my parents time. So, like I say, every one of these in a way is a, is a favorite story of mine. Uh, so I better stop now and let you ask some more questions. Well, you you mentioned the Bentley, and uh, and Greg at the Bentley, who you know anybody who's worked um, in university history knows what a great um, friend and ally of the university and of historians is, and and also a fierce believer in like let's tell the truth, um, as as you and Kim uh, were um, and are. Um, one of the things about the Bentley that's great, and I know you've spent a lot of time there. I've spent a lot of time there. Um, I've spent you know, way more time there than you have, dude. I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> one of the one of the fun things that I that I that I experience when I go there is, you know, you have to go in. Most of the material is not on display. You have to sort of know what you're looking for and make a request, and they bring the box to you, and you open it up, and you find these unexpected treasures inside, or maybe expected. And then every once in a while, you know sometimes at random, I would just go and ask for, you know, a, a box kind of out of the blue. And, and there was this great feeling of discovery. And I know you've had that as well. So um, what I'm wondering is if either at the Bentley or just in the course of the research that you've done, you know, what were things that really took you by surprise? Things that you just had oh, no idea was going on. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know that, that's for me. The, the 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 Bentley is the unsung hero of you know certainly this book, um, if, if if you can say that about a book, um, but it 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 just is this amazing place. And I you know I wish every student had a chance to do exactly what you just described to ask for a box out of the stacks at random, and just just look at it, and and all of a sudden you're just transported. You realize oh my God, this place isn't just me and my friends and my professors and what's happening around me right now. It's this deep, rich, layered thing that goes back many, many years. I'll give you one good example um, in, in response to your question. So there's, a, <clears throat> there's an amazing um, collection of the Bentley. Um, I'm not sure how this project got started originally. It's a series of oral history interviews with members of the law school faculty. Now, my dad is a graduate of the law school. So I had this, you know, kind of natural interest in the, in the, the law school's history. Can't remember which story it was that led me into these oral history interviews, some of which are still closed to the public. <laughs> uh, 
and some of which are closed to the public, but they're in the boxes with the ones that are open to the public. And so nobody's standing over your shoulder saying, hey, you can't open that folder. And one of those was um, uh, an oral history interview. And when, when I say oral history, what I'm talking about is uh, something that you know looks like a big thick stack of manuscript, typed manuscript, transcript of recorded interviews with people. And this one in particular was with the great U of M law professor, Yale Kamisar, one of the most famous professors in the law school's history. A guy who had a major impact on the, um, the history of American law, basically the father of the Miranda warnings. Um, just this amazing guy who also had this huge larger than life personality. And I had interviewed him once for a story about one of his colleagues, Catherine McKinnon, also a famous and important member of the law faculty. That's another story. And um, he had been irascible, terrifying to interview. I was much younger then. And, uh, and I heard he hated the story that I wrote about Catherine McKinnon. <laughs> so I wasn't, I wasn't inclined to go back and interview him again. But I was curious about him, had always been impressed by him. And I read this, this, this uh, interview and I just was immersed in this guy's life because he told everything. He told about how his mother um, hit him when he came home with less than a straight A's report card when he was a kid growing up in uh, the Bronx, I think it's from, he was from. So I read and read and I thought I have to write this guy's story. So I had to ask him for permission to use this oral history, which he generously granted. I, I interviewed him um, and uh, told this long story about him as sort of, so what, what I think of as the exemplar of, of a great research university faculty member, a great, an amazing teacher, um, but also a guy who became so immersed in his field, such an expert in his field, blazing trails um, in this particular field, the law, that, that had a huge impact. And this is a guy who, who sits in the library and just reads stuff all day long uh, and thinks about it. And so that was that, you know, that was just another day at the Bentley. And I happened to open this folder and start to read this thing. And I had one of the stories that I'm proudest of. Let me see, uh, Bentley history uh, moments. Um, gosh, uh, it, it, God, it just, I mean, every story sort of has one of those moments. Um, oh, uh, I, uh, that's the best example I can give you, John. Uh, now I'm, I don't want to grasp for things um, and take up too much time. So, what, I mean, I've been asking a lot of questions. Let me um, ask uh, John at Literati. Do, do we have questions in the Q and A? Do we want to take some from the from the audience? So we have we have one we have one question so far, and I will remind people to uh, submit their questions using the Q and A if you have any questions for James Tobin this evening. Um, and perhaps after this question, John, if we don't have any additional questions, we can, we can, I feel like you and Jim might have more to talk about, um, but a third, John, always do. <laughs> yeah, a, a third John writes in and asks, uh, I respect and enjoyed your selection uh, on Pretzel Bell, Drake's and Dominic's as the three hangouts you chose to portray, but I can't help but wonder what the next three are. Oh. <laughs> well, um, I, you know, there are major hangouts in the recent times, you know, that I hear my daughters talking about, right? But I wouldn't dare to try to write about those. I mean, you know, scorekeepers, you know, that the, you know, they call skeeps, right? And like, I haven't ventured inside. When I go by scorekeepers on Maynard, I think, Oh yeah, Dooley's isn't there anymore. I mean, this is a place that's been there for you know like decades, and I still think of it as Dooley's, right? Um, a place we used to love to go. You know, I mean, um, I'd be tempted to write again. You know, places that mean something that mean a lot to me. Um, that that are kind of, I mean, some are there, but a new sort of new uh, incarnations. I mean, the Cottage Inn has been a lot of things and uh, including the place where um, Alan Judy Guskin came up with the idea of the Peace Corps immediately after John F. Kennedy's speech that night. Another interesting thing, it wasn't Kennedy's idea. It was the student's idea. He comes up with this question, how many of you are willing to work around the world? And the Guskins, 
uh, husband and wife or grad students talk to some of their pals and then they say, let's, let's go to Kennedy and say, yeah, we're willing, you know, what will you do about it? And they greeted him on the tarmac of the Toledo airport a week or two later and said, hey, we're serious about this. Look at this petition that we got up. And so he turned to his guys and said, hey, is this something we ought to talk about again? <laughs> that was the Peace Corps. Anyway, that happened at Cottage Inn. Um, you know, I mean, real, you know, uh, diner dives like Steve's Lunch on South University, long gone, uh, Bicycle Gyms on South University, the Village Bell, the Greek place um, that was the, owned by, I think, the same folks that uh, the casters who owned uh, uh, the Pretzel Bell. Um, I guess those are ones that I would mention. Geez, I mean, John, you'd be able to, the Brown Jug, the Wolverine Den. Um, but uh, oh, these, yeah. I, I got to tell you, these those stories took a lot of work, okay? It wasn't that hard to get people to talk about Drake's, but I had a strangely hard time writing about the Pretzel Bell. There wasn't, there wasn't, you know, there weren't archival materials to go look at. So um, I'd love for John to, to submit his suggestion in the, or suggestions in the chat for, for more hangouts to, to go to, definitely. I would just throw in from my times at the MFA program that that old town became quite a old town. Uh, oh yeah those mfas i still see them in old town <laughs> old town used to be a towny place you know and and, and the the, the, the it still is i think yeah well to some extent but the hipster mfas discovered it <laughs> oh, God. I, I i i i'm sitting there at, at, at old town on a friday afternoon and and I, I i know the mfas when they come in it's like okay all right <laughs> you're welcome here <laughs> Fleetwood, you know, the Fleetwood Diner. I mean, that, you know, that, that would be a good place to write about. I was going to say, if, if, if my experience was a guide, you'd have to include Old Town Fleetwood and 8-Ball. But uh, maybe that says more about me. 8-Ball yeah, than... like, like, is so, like, that's <laughs> new for me. Like, I hear people talk about that. And that's that's way, way cooler than I could ever be. So. <laughs> um, well, that's our only question for now. But, but John, if you've got other questions for Jim, I'll, I'll jump back on when, when we have some more. Sure. Well, um, you know, I encourage anybody to ask, uh, throw in questions or reflections of your own. Um, Jim, you know, this is in your writing, you uh, generally tend to avoid talking about yourself, um, including in, in the writing in that of the, the original pieces in this book. But in the book, you've interjected a lot of your own stories. You've, inter you've told stories about how you came to write the piece, but you, you know, in the introduction that you read, you shared a lot about, you know, your experience of the university and your rootedness here and threaded throughout um, is a lot more personal um, material than I'm, than I'm used to reading from you. And I'm wondering, you know, what, what went into that choice and, and, you know, how does it, how, how does it feel to be, to be sharing that now? Um, you know, what, what, what led to it and how's, how's it feeling to you? Well, um, it, it, um, having sort of, um, I became a writer as a journalist and, and so, you know, to write in the first person was never, you know, uh, that, you know, that's, that's trained out of you when you, when you become a journalist. And so, I never got in the habit, and um, <clears throat> whenever I tried it, it felt uncomfortable and you know even painful. You know, highly self-conscious. But I've done it a little bit more over the last few years, <clears throat> and I've gotten a little bit more comfortable with it. Um, partly because I uh, have, in, in my teaching at Miami, students will often write memoirs for me, and so I've thought about memoir more and coached them on that, even though I haven't written much myself. So this was a little bit of, a, of an experiment in doing that. The, the, the approach to the book came about because my longtime friend, Fran Bluen, the, um, the longtime director of the Bentley Library, great figure in the Bentley's history, um, who, who taught my wife when she was a graduate student in the archives program uh, back when we first met, he, um, the, the University of Michigan Press, which, which deserves credit for this book, and Scott Hamm, my great editor there, showed the idea for this book to Fran Bluen as a kind of outside reader and you know, a reviewer, as academic presses do. Um, so what do you think? Should we publish this? Fran said, 
yeah, maybe uh, okay to write a, a to to publish a collection of Jim's pieces, but you really ought to ask Jim to uh, write more in this book about what all this adds up to, why he why he wrote these pieces, and um, what are his thoughts about the university and sort of in summation. Well, you know that's kind of not the way I think about things, but um, that that suggestion led me to write these. Um, transitional essays in the book, the, the uh, introduction, the epilogue, and to sort of weave all this together. Um, and that was fun because uh, it, it gave me a chance to, to write a little bit about both my mom and my dad, um, thinking about my mom, her time at, at Michigan um, in the late 30s, uh, when um, the time of the early so-called co-eds, the, the earliest generations of women at, at Michigan had passed. Um, the, the, those early women in the late 19th century were highly independent, highly career oriented. And then really at the hands of um, a succession of deans of women, their lives at Michigan became segregated from the men and they were steered more and more into what we now think of as the traditional women's careers. Uh, teaching, nursing, and that's about it. Um, and if you weren't in one of those tracks, you were studying for the so-called MRS degree. Now, my mom came and was a, a serious and enthusiastic student, but she majored in French. She wasn't aiming at a career. And so no, having, having learned more about the history of women at Michigan, I was able to kind of place my mom in that context. And so I wrote a little bit about, about her. Um, the place where my dad comes in is largely in this new piece that I wrote about the now uh, defunct honor society called that was senior honorary all for men that was called Michigana. Started in 1902 and it went down to, to the year um, 2006 when it was transformed into a new um, uh, deliberately multicultural and um, uh, uh, sort of gender unconscious uh, organization called the, the Order of Angel. Um, it's, it was disbanded early this year. So um, I, got, I got thinking hard about the history of Michigana um, last year at the time when uh, Confederate statues were coming down, when um, Native American nicknames and logos were being discarded by sports teams uh, in, in a sort of new wave of that movement to get rid of those old uh, stereotypes. Um, and I got thinking about my, my dad's own role and my own role, because I had joined Michigan briefly in the 70s and then quit um, after I had sponsored a resolution to admit women. So um, that led to this rather complicated <laughs> and not fully resolved uh, essay that, that I wrote as the last piece in the book. And so I'm still thinking about Michigan and may write more about it. Um, in a in a book, I'm, I'm pondering that now. So um, that that was really uh, that that's where I really had to grapple with my own connections to the history of the place uh, in a, in a new way. And so that was interesting. I think not entirely successful yet, but um, boy, I really had to come face to face with my own uh, my own sort of identity as a as a white male at the university. You and I have talked about this. Um, so um, yeah, that's, that's been a key thing for me. I have a couple other questions from the audience if, if I might jump in. Um, uh, Kimberly writes, you get to have dinner with three figures from U of M's past. Who are they? Mm. Let's see. Well, um, you have to pick Tappan. Um, who is in many ways the most important figure in the university's history. There wouldn't be a University of Michigan without Henry Philip Tappan. I don't think I would do much talking, um, but, uh, but I would love to hear him hold forth. Um, let's see. You know, if I could talk to Belford Lawson, that would be great and say, what the hell did happen exactly with you and Field and Yost and Coach Harry Kipke? Uh, I'd love to do that. And I mean, I hate to mention people I've already talked about, um, uh, but I'm tempted to say again, Mary Downing Sheldon, uh, for what she could reveal about, about the, um, the nature of the university in those 
in those years. Let's see, who else would we think of, John? Um, gosh, um, well, there's a story that I haven't mentioned that, that, that maybe I worked hardest on of all. Um, and it's about a professor named Lawrence Klein. In the, in the 50s, um, during the McCarthy uh, era, there were three professors who were famously blacklisted and lost their positions because of their past associations with the Communist Party of the USA. Uh, Chandler Davis, Clement Markert, and Mark Nickerson. Those are the names that were famous in that era. I started out to, to write some kind of a story about those three. I had written about them before. Um, but then I realized that there was a fourth person, Lawrence Klein, who had also um, come up against opposition within the faculty, never technically blacklisted, but basically forced out of the faculty um, by, uh, largely by an anti-Semitic member of the business, of the economics department and the business school faculty. And I got fascinated by this case. And um, again, because of the, the terrific materials at the Bentley, that, 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 those were discoveries at the Bentley that I, that I was, you know, it was like lightning struck when I was reading these interviews on the page and realizing what had happened to this guy. Um, Lawrence Klein um, went on to win the Nobel Prize at the Wharton School of Economics. I would love to sit down and talk to Klein about what happened to him. So that, that's another one for sure. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, could, could Jim speak about his time at the Michigan Daily? How did it shape him as a writer? Did he work on any stories as a student that he later returned to? as a professional writer? Yeah, well, that's a great question, John. The Daily was everything to me when I was, when I was a student at U of M. I, I went in there the first week of classes as a freshman thinking I wanted to be a journalist. It was shortly after the resignation of Richard Nixon and the Watergate scandal, and we all knew about Woodward and Bernstein. And uh, I just thought this would be the greatest thing in the world. And I walked into the cavernous city room of the Michigan Daily up on the second floor on Maynard Street. And I thought, this is it, man. This is, this is what I want to do. And that was it from then on. And I, I loved the Daily. My, uh, I had great friends in my fraternity, Phi Gamma Delta, but my, really my closest cadre of friends were, were at uh, the Daily. And there was a story that I came back to. Uh, I wrote a long two-piece um, project about Michigama. Uh, because it was right in the days when um, Michigan was coming under fire for um, violations of Title IX, the university for violations of Title IX, discriminating against women. And so I wrote about that. I wrote about the history of the, of the, of the place. <laughs> joined, the, joined the tribe, as it was called, uh, the following year, then quit. Um, and so in writing about Michigan recently, I dragged out those old Michigan Daily stories of mine and... Um, realized what a really, truly terrible student journalist <laughs> I had been. Um, uh, and, uh, but, but I got a lot out of reading those pieces again, and they helped me to write this recent, this recent essay about, about Michigama. Wonderful. Well, we've reached the top of the hour just now. Um, James Tobin, John Lofi, thank you so much for joining us tonight on Anaheim with Literati. Of course, if you haven't yet purchased Sing to the Colors. We have copies available in our store in downtown Ann Arbor. You can also uh, use the link that I've dropped into the chat to buy your copies from us online. If you're watching us later on YouTube, there are always links to purchase books in the description directly below me. I uh, hope we can do this again in the store soon. Uh, but until then, uh, James and John, hope you continue to be safe and, and well. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at the next event. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks a lot, John. So long.